Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the One Thing Podcast. We are so excited to have Sonia Jass here, who is an acclaimed mindset author and speaker on a mission to help others achieve self-actualization. That's 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 a big lead in, Sonia. So I'm excited for people to get to get to learn more with about you, you and learn from you. the day just barely with my children. <laughs> so yes, self actualization sounds like a big agenda, doesn't it? <laughs> Sometimes that is self actualization. Sometimes surviving the day with young children is in fact self actualization. Oh. We started off the the podcast before we actually started recording. We were talking about that, giving each other our our young children mom woes. Uh, but Sonia is a leading voice in wellness and personal development who has inspired millions through a very viral TED Talk, Where Do the Happy People Live? And we're going to be talking a lot about that and her best-selling book, I'll Start Again Tomorrow <laughs> and Other Lies I've Told Myself. I just love the title. Uh, uh, Sonia's message, message is very clear. You will all hear it today that she, you can live a life of ease, joy, purpose, and authenticity, one of my top values, uh, while still achieving your dreams. Welcome, Sonia. We're so so excited to have you. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Honestly, our, our sidebar conversation, I feel like, kicked off this whole session so beautifully. So I'm ready to dive in. And hopefully my children leave me alone for just like another <laughs> 45 minutes. <laughs> And if they don't, that's okay too, because every entrepreneurial parent listening to this would be like, yep, I get it. Uh, we've all had those stories, especially in, in the world of working from home, the kids who run into Zoom meetings butt naked or <laughs> or are yelling crazy things in the background. And it's like, you just, oh, you just so learn to keep going so as a parent. Um, I, like I said, uh, before we started recording, I just loved the title of the book because I felt seen just in reading the title. I, I'll start again tomorrow and other lies I've told myself. I was like, yep, yep. We've all told each other, told ourselves those lies, told other people's those lies, those <laughs> lies. Tell me what the, the, uh, the impetus for this book was. I think, you know, for me as sort of somebody in the mindset and wellness space, I've often found online that you know, we have this idea that, you know, us experts are somehow like magic unicorns who are just like sort of like healed. And we just, we arrive on the scene with all this insight and knowledge and we're ready to like transform people's lives. And there's no insight into the struggle or the journey or the real human behind this like brand and this voice. And I think for me, the biggest missing link has been just getting into the vortex of the noise with people and really helping people to feel less alone in that shame and guilt and fear and that on the wagon, off the wagon, never ending spiral that we all seem to deal with. And so I think, you know, throughout my career, it was obviously working with clients hands-on at first. And then from there, I sort of moved into the speaking space, but I felt like there was a book that was waiting to be written so that everybody could just have an honest look at somebody else's story and let that be a mirror to their own story so that they could feel less alone in their journey. And also just come away with some like practical tools, practical insights, words of wisdom to help make the journey feel less soul sucking because this isn't anybody's first attempt, right? Like we've all tried to crack the code on how we quote unquote fix ourselves, whether it's about meditation or cold plunging or working out or anything else, drinking water. We're all some way, shape or form dealing with the tug of war internally to make it to the other side. And for so many of us, we believe that happiness is just 10 pounds away. And if we can get there, then we're going to finally feel the way we want to feel. And I went through that journey from the age of nine until 25 and it was relentless and it was exhausting and it was painful. And yes, I made it to the other side and the journey continues. But I think for me, the book was really meant to just peel back the layers on the facade and just show people like what it actually took to get me to the place that I was at where I could be quote unquote, like, an expert, let's call it, you know? Yeah. I think this is such an important conversation too, Sonia, like where, where you led this all off was this sort of, especially Chris and I are obviously heavily in the self-development and, and business development space too. And we talk to a lot of experts in their different fields. And by the way, they are experts. And sometimes we've, we've chatted about this before that it can feel 
exhausting because when you're reading these books, I always explain to people, you're, you're reading the best of someone. Yeah. You're reading the, uh, the absolute perfect day, the absolute perfect scenario, the perfect way to handle this, the perfect way to do this. And for us as uh, us mere mortals, like the rest of the, you know, the human race, we can often start feeling like, well, maybe there's something wrong with me because I can't do the morning routine every day because I have kids and they woke up crazy this morning because that happens. Or maybe I couldn't get to bed by eight because they wouldn't go to bed. Or maybe I didn't fit the workout in today because I was just freaking exhausted. <laughs> like I just went to war today or whatever it is. And, and we don't have that conversation. So a lot of people sort of end up giving up. Do you see that? Like they end up giving up on this, on this development journey because they can't make it perfect, which isn't real. No, which isn't real. And, you know, I talk so much about perfectionism in my book, right? Because it is something that so many of us struggle with more and more now because of the hashtag world, social media, you know, perfectly curated images that we see, even like the perfect version of vulnerability that we see that's like <laughs> just enough, but like not messy. It's like we see so much of this online self-care looking a certain way, bubble baths and candles and no pores and visuals. And I think it leaves so many of us just feeling helpless and kind of hopeless with the fact that like, we're never going to be able to get our shit together. It's never going to look like that. It's never going to feel like that. And so then what's the point in trying or yes, I'm going to try, but my limiting beliefs, the stories, the lies that I tell myself are going to take hold because I'm trying to fit myself into a model that's not meant for me, right? And I think so many of us deal with this now in particular because we're seeing everybody's best case scenarios, everybody's chapter 10, comparing it to our own chapter one. And that disconnect, the distance between chapter one and chapter 10 feels so big that at some point in time, that internal motivation, that little fire that's ignited It starts to dwindle because honestly, as you said, the kids woke up, they're in a bad mood. We're juggling all sorts of things all the time. And motivation isn't enough to carry the follow through. It comes down to so much more. But when we're plagued by perfectionism, when we need to get it right, when we fall into the all or nothing approach, which so many of us do, like it's a daily reminder for me even now as the quote unquote expert to not fall prey to the all or nothing, to allow my journey to be a call and response to my reality, to have my wellness be a reaction to what I actually feel like I need, not a system that I'm trying to implement and then struggle to keep up with. Yes, the journey changes and it unfolds in a way that starts to really become productive and valuable and positive. But to get out of that mentality, And find yourself in a place where you are willing to actually create slow, incremental, unsexy change in your life. That takes a shift in mindset. That takes a shift in the approach. And that's sort of why I wrote the book the way that I did, right? Because so often we're like, oh my God, we want to get skinny. Great. 30 day abs go. And it's like about getting on with the doing. But as I've learned in my life with everything, but particularly when it's come to my relationship with my body and my wellness, so much of the work is done in the mindset work that's required to shift the approach so that the journey can be different when you're in doing mode. You got to clarify the mindset work first so that you can put it into action through the doing. One without the other doesn't work. But if we don't get clear on the foundation, it's just going to be the same cycle again and again and again, two steps forward, three steps back, one step forward, two steps back. And it's exhausting. Like we're so tired of it. And yet we can't seem to break free because again, social media creates the vortex. Do you, do you find my experience, Sonia, working in coaching and and teaching and around the one thing is people will build a plan or set big goals. Sometimes the challenge I run into is they set too big of goals in the short term, but they'll inevitably feel like they're off track and they'll find themselves off track. But really, it's more that their plan just didn't go according to plan. And they really lack the tools and and or like you said, mindset 
to get back on track or ask the right questions. And I'm curious if you, if you see that in a similar vein, it, that it's really just about recognizing that your plan is not going to go according to plan and how do you set yourself up for success? Yeah, absolutely. I see that all the time, you know, even with myself, right? Like even to this day, you know, I fall off the wagon a little bit for a day or two and then I'm like, great, tomorrow I'm drinking three liters of water and then I'm peeing all day and I'm like, oh my God, this was a disaster and the whole thing just becomes a mess. But, you know, I think for, for so many people, it it's, it's that the plan is out of alignment mm. with what they really need. It is a plan based on ideals, a plan based on wishful thinking, a plan based on pushing rather than responding. And I think the foundation there really comes from not having clarity around your values. And I hate the word values because it's like so woo-woo, but I really mean your evaluation criteria. You know, you think sort of like when you're an adult, you're just going to like know what you need, know who you are, and then just like feed your life through that evaluation criteria. And there you are. Now you're successful and happy. Turns out most of us are really just winging it based off of legacy operating values, ideas, systems, programs, paradigms. We just are sort of ping-ponging between everybody, everybody else's ideas of who we should be, who we need to be, what we need to be doing, how we need to feel. And I think without that fundamental clarity on your evaluation criteria for your life, what is the highest version of you looking to stand for? How can you have the foundation of a system that works, right? You're again, just sort of building something that looks good, hoping for the best. But when you can gain that foundational clarity, when you can really get clear on why you want what you want, why you think what you want is going to make you feel a certain way and why you want to feel that way to begin with, you really start to create an environment for clarity that can allow you to build the steps as you go as a response to that version of who you are growing into being, right? I think when we look for a plan that's going to go according to plan, we again set ourselves up for failure because, as you know, none of us are robots. Mm. The plan's never going to go according to plan. The question is, why is the plan that way to begin with? Mm. Why are we expecting it to go according to plan? And why does it need to look a certain way for us to feel like we're getting closer to the finish line? Because there is no finish line. What finish line, right? I think that's the big thing that we all sort of eventually realize is that like nobody's waiting there with a trophy. You think you want to lose 10 pounds. Once you get to the 10 pounds, you're going to want abs. Once you want abs, you're going to want to run a marathon. Once you run a marathon, you're going to want more. It is a never ending snowball of not being good enough and thinking that we can achieve something, whether it's weight loss or a promotion or a new relationship to make ourselves feel good enough. But that momentum starts to dwindle and we start to realize along the way, I'm not feeling any better. This isn't actually working. I'm actually just exhausted. I hate running. 90 minutes of fasted cardio is the worst. And then we fall off the way again. Because again, that clarity wasn't there to begin with. So you we're both giggling a little bit because the, the podcast we have coming on right before yours, the week before yours, is all around values. Okay. And Chris and I both literally use the words like it feels a little woo-woo and it's really important <laughs> to identify those values. And to be clear on them for this exact explanation that you're giving, that we often don't know what we should be doing or not be doing if we haven't really made a decision about who we are and what we stand for. Mm -hmm. and, you, and, and you said something really important. I think that this trap is so prevalent right now because information is so prevalent in the world of social media. And you talk about this in the book uh, about people really being susceptible to different like trends, specifically self-development or our mm -hmm. achievement trends. 
and they try to do them perfectly and then they fall off and then they try to do it perfectly and then they fall off. And it, and some of them are impossible. Like I listen to some of these gurus talk about these hour and a half long morning routines. I assure everyone like they, they didn't do that what, while they were getting successful because they were grinding to get successful. Exactly. They have only recently had the time to do that hour and a half long morning routine. It's completely unrealistic for, again, the rest of us mere mortals. So I, and, and I, I love how you talk about this and how you help people understand how to find alignment in this. Can you talk more about that, how you help coach people to do that? Yeah, I think, you know, the big piece about building a routine and creating a system for yourself is, is again, getting very clear on those foundational values. You know, when we look at wellness, it's very easy to be like, okay, like now I'm carb free, I'm dairy free, I do fasted cardio in the morning, then I do hit sessions, and I'm spinning, then I'm running, okay, then I'm doing cold plunging, and then I'm doing contrast therapy, and I'm drinking reishi tea. It's just, again, as you said, there's so much out there that people are touting to be like the elixir or the answer. And if you can just crack the code and do it the way I'm doing it, then you're also going to be able to like heal yourself and change your life. But what I found for myself is when I can help somebody get clear on their pillars, on their buckets, movement. Okay. Yeah. Is movement important? Why is movement important? What kind of movement do I not hate doing? Cool. Nutrition. What is it about nutrition? Is it nutrition? Is it calories? Is it fuel for performance or is it about aesthetics? There's so many different drivers when it comes to what we're doing, getting really clear on what those drivers are when it comes to moving your body, when it comes to eating, when it comes to lifestyle. It's so critical because again, when you have those pillars, you can line yourself up with options and activities and actions within those areas that can meet you wherever you really are on the day that you're living, right? So for example, rather than it being an all or nothing approach and it's like, you know, if I don't do the 60 minute routine in the morning, then what's the point even? Let me eat yeah. all the Why donuts. Why move on today. with the day? <laughs> right. Eat the donuts today too, though. Get it all in like spicy popcorn until I can't breathe anymore. <laughs> and then like go to bed and then like wake up in the morning and I'm going to start again because like now I'm going to be suddenly over it and ready to get back on the wagon. Oh, but I can't because I didn't sleep that well. And so like now suddenly it's day two where I'm not getting in that perfect workout and we create the slippery slope. But when you can get clear on the pillars and you can get clear on your version of activities or actions or choices that fall into those pillars, then you have a menu that you can choose from on a daily basis to help you keep aligned action at the forefront of what you're doing and that positive momentum continuing. So for example, last night, I got three and a half hours of sleep. Wasn't a great night. I had planned to work out this morning and do a spin session. I woke up and was like, you didn't get enough sleep. You're not feeling great. Now, historically, you're right. I would have woken up and been like, oh God, well, I didn't sleep. And okay, either I would have pushed myself to work out super hard anyway and been like, doesn't matter, no sleep for the week. Or I would have been like, okay, I need a break today. I don't feel good. But I would have regressed in the, into the comfort of food to make myself soothed, feeling better, ready to just sort of like end the day in fetal position, hoping that tomorrow I'm going to be able to turn things around. When in reality, I woke up today, wasn't feeling great, was like, oh, I'm tired. Okay, so then from the nutrition bucket, what, what can I do today that feels within my capacity to help nourish myself because I am exhausted? That's still going to help me feel like, okay, I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. What can I do from a movement perspective that's no longer going to be the spin session in the morning that's going to be a response to how I really feel? Maybe it's stretching today. Maybe it's a little bit of yoga. Maybe it's just a walk. Maybe I'm getting some steps in. But what can I pick from the portfolio of options that I've created for myself in each of the buckets to ensure that at the end of today, I feel like I was not off the wagon 
but rather responding to where I really was today from the predetermined choices that I've created for myself so that I can just go through the menu and be like, today's the day for this, 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 took the AG1, done, Mm -hmm. healthy, and in line with my capacity today. Sleep early, rest, wake up in the morning. Tomorrow's again another day where, yes, I'm going to have ideas of what tomorrow's going to look like, but I'm, I'm able to create a system that's at my fingertips so that I'm able to respond to life as it's happening, as opposed to these rigid ideas of how life should be happening and how I should be feeling. Because as you both know, when we should ourselves, we ruin the magic of everything that's really supposed to be happening for us. Right. Mm. Yeah. Can you, could you Sonia expand a little bit on uh, what you mean by pillars? I think that'd be helpful for people to understand like how you define or separate or measure success in those areas. Great question. So I think for me, when I think about pillars, I look at sort of some of the foundational elements of my life that I believe are important for me to feel like I'm living in alignment and also moving in the direction of my highest self, my potential. So for me, that in, that involves mindset work on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. And that mindset work may be breath work. It may be meditation. It may be affirmations. It may be an audiobook if I'm lazy. It may be all sorts of things in that bucket that I can pick and choose from depending on like what I feel like I need to clarify how I'm feeling, drop back into my, you know, adult self, let go of the stories and the lies that I'm telling myself and just feel like I am in the driver's seat of my life on purpose with clarity. Journaling is another example, Mm -hmm. something that I utilize all the time in that bucket. Mm -hmm. When it comes to movement, I have various different elements to the movement pillar, but movement is important to me. I want to feel strong. I want to feel healthy. I recognize the value of moving my body so that I can protect my muscle mass so that I can continue aging in a way that I am able to keep up with my like four-year-old pirate child. (laughs) So I think, you know, for me, movement feels like I'm an important bucket, but an evolution, for example, in the movement bucket lately for me has been stretching Mm -hmm. and mobility because I turned 40 this year and mama can't do it quite as well as she used to before. Right. And so here we are now sort of looking at the bucket of movement where there's cardio for me, cardiovascular health, there is strength and strength building, but now there's movement, mobility, flexibility, and just the fundamental need to be not sedentary and sitting all the time. Right. So in that pillar for me, there are various different options that I can pull from on a daily basis to be like ticky mark done. You got your movement in. What is that going to look like today? Well, that's going to depend on my capacity. When it comes to nutrition, same thing, right? Like it's easy to get caught up in calories versus like, you know, micronutrients and then macronutrients and all the confusing things that exist out there. But what do I believe in? Okay, in that bucket, I believe in hydration. I believe in getting enough protein. I believe in X, Y, Z. And as long as I can make sure that I'm getting a couple of those in on a daily basis, I'm like, Okay, here we are. We're showing up. When it comes to learning, lifelong learning, if that's another pillar, it is for me. Okay, what is that going to look like? Am I I doing Duolingo? Am I reading a book? Am I taking a course? What am I doing to take myself from where I'm at and move it further? And so again, these are not the pillars that everybody needs to have. Mm -hmm. People can have whatever pillars they want, but if you don't know what's important to you, how are you navigating what you're doing? Then it's just a response to the trends. Now somebody said cold plunging is good. Now somebody said I should read this book. Now somebody said I need a promotion. Now I need more money. Now, What is it? What do you really want? And so to me, whether it, whether you want to look at them as buckets, whether you want to look at them as principles, you want to look at them as pillars, it doesn't really matter. But if you can't define like the top five things that are core to you as your highest self, you're just winging it. And let me tell you, it sucks because it's not going to go your way Mm. because we can't, we can't create from a place of grasping. Do you set in those, in those pillars, do you, I, I, I hear you that you kind of vary what you're doing in there as you learn and evolve and do you 
think about goal setting in those buckets or like bigger picture, longer term vision of, of success in each of those areas? Yes and no. Mm -hmm. I think inherently for me specifically, because I've inherently been a perfectionist, a very like type A self overrider for the purposes of getting to the finish line. I'm actually at a stage of my life where I'm like, I need less goals. I need no goals, (laughs) no more goals for me. Actually, every day needs to be a deliberate choice to move with intention and clarity, but to release the goal aspect of Mm -hmm. it because I'm so good at overriding who I really am, what I really need, what actually feels good for the sake of the goals. I found that by anchoring myself to clarity and intention, I'm able to accomplish what I used to think were goals faster, easier, more joyously, with more ease, which is something I inherently have never been able to do before. Mm. And so what's fascinating for me is that when I've let go of these like tight ideas around goals, I've actually found myself moving in harmony with myself better and ultimately accomplishing what I would have considered to be goals anyway. But also what's become so exciting for me in this shift is that I have more moments of clarity. I have more ahas. I have more positive inertia that I wouldn't have been able to discover because I was rigidly chasing a goal. You know, it's almost like when you stop gripping the wheel so hard the car is able to sort of move where it kind of wants to go a little bit more naturally. And then you're like, oh my God, this is way better than the goal that I thought I had or the thing that I was chasing towards. And so do I believe in goals? Yes. Do I think everybody should have goals? Yes. Do I think for some people it's incredibly important to really hone the skill of setting goals and accomplishing them so that you know that it is a flex that you can offer yourself? Absolutely. Then there comes a time in life, I think, where once you are the master of accomplishing goals, you got to take it easy, Mm -hmm. sit back a little bit and be like, now it's about moving with alignment and intention. And all the things that I was chasing are not really relevant, but the goals or the achievements or whatever it is, they'll happen along the way. I think what I hear, Sonia, is that you kind of move from like goals for goals sake, right? I'm setting this goal just so I can achieve it to moving to these are my standards by which I'm choosing to live. Like everything I hear you saying is this is just my standard for how I move through the world for myself, for the people that I treat. And I think that this is such an important evolution. And you mentioned like how things are changing as you're getting older. And I think that this is such an important evolution for the achiever, especially. I know, uh, I know I've personally gone through this. I used to be a, a very competitive athlete and, and the, and the world of working out like changed and there takes it requires an evolution within yourself you really to feel like, yeah, stretching is for 30 minutes sometimes is is what you're going to get. And that's OK. Yeah. And it's better than zero. Yeah. And by the way, it's better than pushing through and 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 running a 15 mile you know run when you're really not feeling up to it. Exactly. And I'd love to hear your perspective. And I think as you grow through that, I, this was certainly a challenge for me and something I hear for a lot of achievers is like, finding that balance between, okay, I'm going to push myself today because I'm not feeling it and I'm just not feeling like it, or I'm not going to push myself today because I'd be pushing myself too far. How do you find that balance? Yeah. You know, it it is, it it is a struggle. And I will say that it's like, it's like something that doesn't come naturally to me because I, I grew up in override mode. It was a very high performance family. It didn't matter how you felt. It was, a system. Do it anyway. Yeah. Suck it up. Do it anyway. It was required of you. And so inherently, you know, that leads to people pleasing, that leads to chasing the goals, that leads to everything outside of yourself versus like, how do I feel today? And so as I've been navigating that shift for myself, what I have found to be the most critical piece of the equation is the mind-body connection. Actually taking myself out of my head, 
however I need to and bringing myself into the presence of my body so that I can connect with what it's actually trying to tell me, Mm. what I'm actually feeling. Am I activated? Are any of my parts driving the car right now? Or is adult Sonia the one that's actually in charge? You know, when you do internal family systems work, what starts to become very clear is that many of us have many, many parts that are running the show, but we're not aware because we are just living from the neck up and we're detached and we're just like a mile a minute. Right. And so for me, the way that I can override and shift myself past the conditioning of my childhood is to really do the mindset work to bring myself back into my body. Because once I'm in my body, I'm clear on what it needs. I'm clear on what I need. I'm clear on all of it. And I'm able to respond to it. I'm thirsty. I drink. I need to pee. I do it. I, you know, anything that needs to be responded to, I'm then present and aware of. And I don't hate myself. So I do it because that's my job for myself. Because if I'm not going to do it, who's going to? But when I'm living from the neck up, I have no idea what is really going on. I'm in the vortex of the noise in my head. I'm plagued with anxiety and fear. I'm like running a mile a minute being like, oh my God, I can, I can do more. I can always do more. It's, it's, a, it's a state of overriding for me that then leads me to what you said, which is pushing as the natural default, right? It, and there are days where I can push myself. It's not that like once I've connected mind and body and I've dropped back into like adult Sonia, I'm like nothing but compassion and tenderness. No, no, I can push, I can rally, I can do this stuff, but it's coming from a very different place. It's coming from a place of, I have a capacity for this and I believe that it's important for me today. And I know that sometimes things are tough and I got to push. It's not coming from a place of shame, fear, judgment, and oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, if I don't do it, then what does that mean about who I am? right? The, the story of why I'm not good enough, why I'm unlovable, why it's never going to be enough if I don't. And this one thing feels like it's the differentiator between me being, you know, amazing, excellent Sonia and being a total piece of shit, right? <laughs> like, it's like, that's the extremes that I live in when I'm not in my body, but when I'm in my body, it's different. And, and here's the thing, that the, the landing in your body is a tough practice when you've been living from the neck up, when you have been detached from your, your core self, your feelings, your needs. And so I'm practicing and I'm practicing every single day and every single day gets a little bit easier. But what I will say is as I continue to strengthen that muscle of understanding that the body keeps the score and that's who I'm listening to, it gets easier and easier and more and more natural. And it creates a beautiful, beautiful cycle because you're only ever responding to what you really need. And so then there is no on the wagon, off the wagon. There is no miscalculating. You're just showing up for yourself and it feels better than not showing up for yourself. Is for is sure. in that in that discovery and reflection of... of- being in your body as you you describe it is that where you started to really uncover the other lies besides you'll get to it tomorrow that that you unpacked in your book you know actually i will say that the the other lies piece of it that i started to unpack in the book was actually an earlier part of the journey mm. it was sort of when i naively embarked on my wellness journey thinking that like oh i've got my shit together in all other areas of my life It's just this like one dirty closet that I have that I haven't cleaned out, but like I'm a bad bitch everywhere else. And in only starting to do the mindset work and really dig into like what was driving me towards perpetual thinness, why did I always feel like I was a combination of parts that needed to be fixed? It was only in starting to explore that that I was like, oh my God, wait a minute, I'm doing this in every area of my life, Mm. like my career like every relationship that I have, like anything I have ever pursued in my entire life 
is the same chase to the end destination, hoping that if I just get that thing, I'm going to finally feel good enough. And I think it was that sort of aha moment that led to the exploration in all areas of my life around where is the incongruency coming from? Where is the misalignment coming from? Whose drum has whose drum have I been marching to the beat of, right? Like what what is what is it? And I think it was that exploration that then led me to quit my corporate career and all the thing things and just make the big massive pivots. This this responding to my body, this being in my body is actually a newer journey. I'd say it's only been going on for a couple of years because I think you get to the point where you do so much work reorganizing the drawers, right? And you're like, okay, mentally the drawers are reorganized. And now it's like, I'm no longer who I used to be. And I feel like I'm in control and this is great. And I'm in alignment. And then you hit the next run of your healing journey. And you're like, oh my God, it's not that I needed to reorganize the drawers. It's that everything in the drawers needs to be burned down. I need to, I need a full purge. I need to donate everything inside the drawers and figure out what really stays and what really goes. And that journey has been about dropping into my body and really finding that deeper source of clarity and an understanding of like, who is Sonia at a, at a deeper soul level than just the goals and the goals and the goals. Mm -hmm. I think, Sonia, we, we hear when we talk about really discovering yourself and really going on on this, um, you know, self-knowing journey and a self-development journey, I think a lot of achievers get fearful that they're going to lose their drive, like mm-hmm. that, that, they, that they resist against it because they're going to lose the drive to achieve, which I actually believe in an odd way comes from this, uh, you talk about the idea of perfectionism and the idea of people pleasing a lot in the book. And I think that that unrelenting drive to achieve often comes from that. Absolutely. And, and, and yet we don't want to, but, and yet we don't want to touch it because we don't want to lose the drive because gosh forbid we not achieve so greatly as before. I'd love for you to walk through your journey. And, and, and often what we see is the people who do take that plunge even end up achieving not only faster, but also greater. Mm-hmm. So it's very counterintuitive, mm-hmm. uh, but I'd love to hear how you had to heal that sort of people pleasing and perfectionist journey in order to get to that place. And and, and maybe a little bit of your thought process and like the vulnerability it took during that. Because I think you have got to have a little bit of faith as you go through it that you're not going to completely undo your all, all the things that you've worked so hard for. Yeah, you really do. And and I, I think for me, if, God, like the journey still continues, you know, it's every step of the way you think like, okay, I've got it now. And then you realize like, what does that even mean? And it's always evolving. And to be willing to let go of these rigid ideas to uncover what could be even more magical is scary and it's hard, right? Like I don't blame anybody for feeling like they don't want to peek underneath the covers because if we lose our drive and we're no longer high performers, then who are we? Right. And in a, in a society in a world that is constantly celebrating high performance and victories and, high, and fast victories and like making it to the top faster than a youngest person, this, like everything I think just feels like there is a sense of urgency that has to happen now. And we can't release our foot from the pedal because if we do, then like maybe we're just going to decide we need to take a nap forever. <laughs> and then we're just going to want to watch TV forever. And then like, what's going to happen? Because like, we just turned into sloths. And I think for me, when I quit the corporate world to become a personal trainer and nutrition specialist, it felt like a very, very risky move in many ways, because I was like, who does this? Like (laughs) I just finished my executive MBA I have a wicked career. And I'm like, no, thanks. Like want to teach people how to exercise, like <laughs> absurd. And also there was a knowing inside that I was going to do something. And I didn't know what, 
But there was a knowing that like, if I'm not in this environment, it doesn't mean I'm not going to be a high performer. I'm just going to find something else that I care more about to put my energy towards. And I think over the years, what I have learned time and time and time again for myself is that like hard work is just part of who I am. I just am. It doesn't matter if I'm going to be the PTA mom or if I'm going to be an executive or if I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I am always going to want to try my best at everything. And it's taken years of me watching myself in action to develop that deeper sense of trust in myself to say, I don't need to be constantly whipping myself into action in order to prove to myself that I want it bad enough. And I think even as the journey has evolved for me, it has taken me sort of big moments in my career where I've had to be like, oh my God, I worked so hard at this project and like, look, it did all the things and great, 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 great. And that, you know, sort of knee jerk desire to jump into the next project so that then the next thing can also be great. That has happened to me many times in my entrepreneurial career where it's been like, got to go, 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 because I just need to like make it to that next clip level. And then once I'm at the next clip level, then I can take a break. Once I'm at the next clip level, I can take a break. But then along the way, I've experienced bouts and bouts of burnout, right? Because again, it's the self-betrayal in all the moments, the overriding in all the moments, believing that if I get there faster, then I'm going to slow down. Realizing every step of the way that like, I never slow down. When do I slow down? Mm -hmm. When have I ever slowed down? I've made it to the clip level. I've taken a minute to be like, ah, I'm exhausted and broken. And the next day I'm like, next project. And candidly, I got to the point at the end of last year, after the book tour was done and everything, and the bestsellers list and the blah, blah, and the whatever, where I was like, I'm staring down the barrel of six projects next year. And I don't think I want to do any of them. Now what? To even be honest enough with myself that like, oh my God, this just feels like more work for the sake of work so that I can be like, see, I didn't slow down. That was just the beginning of how amazing I am. That started to feel like, yo man, even I can't believe my own Mm. That is not, that is not true. It is keeping me on the hamster wheel. I'm back on the hamster wheel. I'm chasing again. And it's so insidious, right? It's so so subtle when those seeds start to get planted again and when you're starting to get pulled out of alignment again. But I think for me, what I have found every step of the way is that when I offer myself a little bit of grace and I offer myself a little bit of compassion and when I give myself a little bit of breathing room to work in harmony with myself as opposed to against myself. What happens is the work flows, I flow. There's nothing but positive momentum that's created. And it isn't a one step forward, two step back. Whereas when I push, it is a one step forward, two step back because I may get to the end, I may get the project done, I may be like, oh my God, I'm amazing for half a second. And then I'm right back to the same place where I'm like, no, I don't, I don't feel good. And now what? And so I think I I continue every day to practice the art of finding a little bit more flow, a little bit more alignment and releasing the outcome really aligning myself with purpose versus outcome. And that's hard when you're a perfectionist. That's hard when you're an achiever because the outcome is frankly, all you're really born and raised to believe matters, right? But when you can align to that clarity and align to the purpose, as you sort of said earlier, it's like suddenly things move differently. They feel differently. The universe conspires differently. And there, there is 
I think there's just a, a much deeper sense of satisfaction along the way, which carries you through the hard parts. And once a high achiever, always a high achiever. Like that's not going to go away. And I think that's the threat that most people feel like, what if I just regress? You're not going to regress. And the speed and the ease that you can move with when you're able to break out of the outcome mentality, it just it just makes everything so much more joyous. Mm. I so appreciate this this differentiation. And in, in my head, I always say it's, you, you move from the sort of reactionary state to this very intentional state, mm-hmm. right? That I'm just reacting to life and I'm just moving for the sake of moving to this, to this very intentional state of I know why I'm doing this. And if I am working hard, that I, I know why I'm working so hard and I know what it means to me and I know what's on the other side and I know what balance I'm bringing to my life on the other side of this hard work. But I especially love you saying what you did about once a hard worker, once a high achiever, always a high achiever, because I do think people miss that in this conversation and on this journey for themselves. Like you're not going to move so far away from who you actually are fundamentally. And most achievers, whether it by nature or nurture, like once, once you're in adulthood, that, that is who you are. Like you are going to be a hard worker. You are going to be an achiever and you're not going to go on this journey and just say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to quit everything and be a couch potato and watch TV all day. Like it's just not going to happen. It isn't. And I think uh, so often we think that like healing or overcoming is going to like lead us to a place where we're just like, we're just like good and chill and we like don't want it anymore. But I think what a lot of people don't realize is how hard the healing process is. You want to talk about being a high performance woman. You want to talk about being full of grit and tenacity and resilience. You want to fight through, you want to flex your problem solving muscles, focus on your healing journey. Like nothing will show you your commitment to excellence more than that, your commitment to yourself more than that, nothing is going to be harder than you breaking through the cycles and the programming that you're used to. It's not going to feel easy. You're not going to be chill. Healing isn't going to be delicious, unfortunately. But what happens along the way is the journey gets easier, more gentle, ease-filled, and it feels good. And you think you can work hard from a place of feeling bad? You just wait until how hard you want to work when you feel good, like really good, not performing feeling good. And trust me, like the, the, I have had to work harder at my healing journey than I've ever had to work in any job, in any version of me being an entrepreneur. Like all of that pales in, into comparison as it relates to my own commitment to the work and So I think it's also adorable and naive for people to think that like, oh, but then I'm going to like feel good and I'm not going to want it anymore. You show me that you can get to a place that you feel good. You get through, you survive the work that you're going to need to do to really be living in alignment as your deepest, most authentic self, as the person that you're meant to be. And then you come back to me and tell me that like, you think maybe it destroyed your high performance nature. Absolutely not you will be uncovering potential like you've never experienced because you're finally connecting with what's true instead of working against yourself, hoping that if you get there, you'll feel better. Love that. I was going to say I relate so much to what you're saying, Sonia, in my own experience. And I was going to try to read it back from, from personal experience, which like I feel like when... There's almost like an effort level that you feel like obligated to put in for the sake of outcome's sake, where you're like, I want to go to 11, right? And it's like, I'm going to go past 10 to 11. And it almost feels like you're trying to force a square peg into a round hole. And, and in doing that, you face resistance to yourself, to your own awareness, to the people around you. And it's just something to, like, if you could just, you're holding on too tight. And if you got to let go a little mm-hmm. bit and listen and ask questions to uncover what you really like what really matters most to you your values uh, the values of the people around you and it's, it's just like go with the flow and not such a, a passive like you know like you're giving up control but just go with the flow like and back off a little bit enough that you can see the opportunities around you yeah. and what really matters to you and i think that's uh something i've experienced yeah you know? So, so true. And I, I think, I think that applies regardless of what you're dealing with, right? This is, it's not about your body. It can be about anything. 
it's all the same thing, right? Mm-hmm. Well, Sonia, I, I wish we could keep you on here forever. You've, you've definitely inspired me today. And I, and I love your perspective around, around not only this journey, but how, how this can evolve and, and actually propel you closer to your ultimate goals, whatever they may be, even if they're different than what you thought they might have been when you started. Right. So thank you for shedding light on that pers- personally from me. Uh, we always ask at the end of this podcast, what's the one thing you would take want listeners to take away from this conversation? If they could walk away from listening to this with just one thing, what would you want that to be? Have the courage to feel. Actually give yourself an opportunity to connect with what's really going on inside rather than picking another goal to chase after. Give yourself an opportunity to really find your way to cultivate better connection with yourself because it's worth it. It's what's going to shift your journey away from being a constant tug of war to one that's not exactly, you know, easy and seamless because we're not robots, but one that's just going to move you closer and closer to who you're meant to be. And if you can give yourself some time and space, remove yourself from social media for a little bit, give your soul a bit of a voice, however that needs to be true for you, whether it's traditional things like mindset practices, or you need to do like ecstatic dance to just feel your energy, like take a step back and really check in with how you are. Because if, if you're not feeling good, if you are in a state of overriding what your mind and body are really trying to tell you, then you're going to be stuck in the vortex, no matter what goals you achieve. And inevitably, you're going to have to buckle up and do the work at some point in time. And so be willing, be open. Nothing's going to change what a high achiever you are. But when you connect with yourself, I think you'll really find the magic comes because then it's a life of alignment, ease, and joy. And that's pretty spectacular. So beautiful. And Sonia, if people want to connect with you, where can they find you? Oh, just on social media at Sonia Joss, all the things, all the places, you know how it is. <laughs> well, we'll drop all the links for, to, uh, for your social, as well as for the book. If people want to pick it up, I'd highly recommend it. We're going to drop all of that in the show notes. Thank you so much for spending some Thank time with you. us today. Thank you. Such a pleasure. Thanks, Sonia. See everybody next time.